Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Michael Easton, and I am a psychiatrist in the Amen Clinics in Chicago. I've been practicing for over 30 years. Prior to coming to the Amen Clinics, I spent 28 years at Rush University Medical Center. That's one of our big teaching hospitals here in Chicago, where I'm still an assistant professor of psychiatry. While I was there, among the many things that I did is I had a large inpatient and outpatient practice, and our area of specialties was treating treatment refractory depression um, and difficult to treat affective disorders. So various forms of depression. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, how do you know what you're treating when someone comes into you and says they're depressed? Um, because that's not necessarily a single diagnosis. It can mean a lot of different things. So we're going to talk about tweezing all of that apart. So what are the objectives? Let's understand the faces of depression and how that affects treatment. What are the different conditions where we see people with clinical symptoms of depression? Um, <clears throat> how do we diagnose these individuals? Using traditional diagnosing, such as the DSM-4, which fundamentally focuses on symptom clusters to try to distinguish separate illnesses. Um, what we do at the Amen Clinic to help with diagnosing, which is basically functional imaging, such as SPEC. And then we'll talk a little, talk a little bit about functional medicine and how they look at underlying causes, which may be either um, aggravating these neuropsychiatric conditions or actually the primary cause of them. And then if we have some time, we'll look at treatment. Um, we'll see how it goes. Let's just start with a quick check of your knowledge. So some of you may know all the answers to these questions, but um, let's just do a couple of true and false questions. So first, diagnoses such as depression are distinct illnesses. True or false? Individuals who present with depression have the same underlying neurobiological abnormalities and should respond to similar treatments. Individuals who present with depression, antidepressants are an appropriate first-line treatment. To be diagnosed with a mood disorder, this is bipolar disorder and its variants, which we'll talk about in more detail, you must have either a manic or hypomanic episode. True or false? And finally, individuals presenting with depression have similar spec scans helping make the diagnosis, true or false. So let's start with <clears throat> what is depression? So from a clinical perspective, depression doesn't mean you feel bad, you're having problems at work, difficulty with your kids or your spouse. It really is a distinct cluster of symptoms. Now, according to the DSM-4, that would dictate <clears throat> that if you have this cluster of symptoms, you actually have a distinct disorder. But actually, people who present with these clusters of symptoms have really different conditions from many etiologies. My best example is a cough. A cough is a cough, but you can have a cough for many different reasons, and the treatments are different for those underlying reasons. But yet, a cough still presents as a cough. So what are the symptoms that we look at that tell us someone has depression? Depressed or anxious mood. And these are consistent symptoms that people have um, all day, most days for extended periods of time. Anhedonia, diminished capacity to experience pleasure. Psychomotor retardation, feeling very slowed down, mentally slowed down, typically obvious to other people, not always the individual. Sleep changes, increased or decreased sleep, changes in appetite and weight, depressogenic thinking. This is pretty characteristic for depression. Um, this was described first.
Why is it so important to recognize this? Well, major depression has serious morbidity and mortality. It's the leading cause of health-related disability in the U.S., and globally, it's ranked second. If you talk to any psychiatrist, we spend a lot of time filling out this disability paperwork for our patients, unfortunately, more so than most physicians who treat other severe chronic medical illnesses. Depression is fatal, potentially fatal. 8% of patients severe enough to require hospitalization will eventually commit suicide. 15% if they go untreated. Depression increases all risks of all cause mortality. In other words, it's associated with multiple medical problems. So you see life expectancies of individuals with depression being less than those without. We don't look at depression as a disorder with severe morbidity and mortality, but it is, and that's why we need to take it so serious. There are two main groups where you see depressive symptoms. These are not the only diagnostic categories where you see depression, but this is what's most common. So when someone comes in and complains of depression, you're going to be looking for unipolar depression or what we call major depression or clinical depression, or they may have a mood or affective disorder for the sake of this discussion. Uh, the rest of this uh, talk, I'll just describe this as mood disorders. And that consists of bipolar disorder, which is manic depressive illness and mood spectrum disorders. These are disorders of mood instability, which we're going to talk about in a lot more detail. And unfortunately, one of the most common mistakes is diagnosing someone with a mood disorder as unipolar depression. And why is this important? One, the treatments are very different. If you have a mood disorder, it can be up to 10 years before you get diagnosed. They say 10 years in 3.3 psychiatrists. So if you have classic manic depressive illness, you may not get diagnosed for three, four or five years and be mistakenly diagnosed as depression. We'll talk about why as we go on. But if you have these unstable mood disorders, in other words, you never have a manic or hypomanic episode, maybe 10 years before you get diagnosed. So what happens, you have much higher morbidity and much higher mortality in these groups, potentially. So let's talk about unipolar depression. How do we define it? Or what lets you know that when you see these symptoms of depression that we discussed, this is unipolar depression. So this is the most important thing. Symptoms don't change. They have people have the same symptoms every day, day after day, week after week, month after month. If you're lucky, you will spontaneously remit in three months or four months or respond to medication. Otherwise, it can go on for a very extended period of time. Um, and typically people will present as either psychomotor retarded depression or depression with predominant anxiety. They don't switch back and forth between the two. And again, this is something we're going to talk about. Like I said, it's persistent. The course can be long, but people have infrequent episodes. So if you have a, a course of depression, it lasts a year. You may not have another one for five to 10 years. The lifetime prevalence is 10%. The majority are mild to moderate severity, so most get treated by primary care. <clears throat> Actually, the statistics are if you have a single episode of unipolar depression, you have a 50% chance of having another episode during the course of your lifetime. Two episodes, around a 75% chance of having another episode during the course of your lifetime. Third episode, it's 90, 95% probability you will have another episode. This is important in terms of when you need to think about long-term maintenance treatment for individuals. What are mood disorders? So mood disorders consist of a couple of different groups. Classically are bipolar one, you have to have a manic episode, 
bipolar 2. You have to have a hypomanic episode. I'll describe what these are in a bit. Cyclothymia. These are people who flip-flop over the course of one to two years between almost hypomanic and almost depressed. They don't really fulfill the diagnostic um, criteria for DSM-4 or 5, um, but they clearly have these fluctuations in mood. Mood spectrum disorders are illnesses where people's moods are just unstable. They may never have a manic or hypomanic episode or anything that even looks like it. So we're going to talk about how you differentiate all of this. It's mood spectrum disorders. These are the ones that get the most misdiagnosed for other things. Lifetime prevalence is 5%. The majority are high severity and they are much more complicated to treat. And that's why these individuals are typically seen in a psychiatric or mental health setting. So what's mania, which means you have bipolar one or hypomania, which means you have bipolar two. Well, these are distinct periods where people have abnormally persistent, elevated, expansive or irritable mood. So that there's some people, they may never feel euphoric or great. They just may be very irritable. And it goes along with abnormally persistent goal-directed behavior or energy. So you'll see things like um, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, um, decreased need for sleep, flight of ideas or racing thoughts. People, they just, you have trouble following them. They just jump ahead all the time. Five topics. Easily distracted, um, increased activity, either goal-directed or agitation, excessive involvement in situations that have a high potential for pain, painful consequences. Um, you know, putting yourself in situations where you're going to get hurt. I had a patient that I saw many years ago. He was actually a, a surgeon. And when he would get manic, he would get a, take a bottle of whiskey and go to a bar where a motorcycle gang hung out, get drunk and start fights with them. Obviously, not a very insightful thing to do. Um, he would never do this if he were not in a manic episode. Oh, and by the way, you see about 50% of people with bipolar disorder have drug or alcohol problems. You actually don't see those rates with unipolar depression. Um, marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or get hospitalized or psychotic feature features or these symptoms happen when you're treated with antidepressants. Hypomania are the same symptoms, but without the same severity of consequences. What are mood spectrum disorders? <clears throat> so this is that last group that we talked about. So this actually makes up the majority of mood disorders. The hallmark is mood instability. Symptoms change. You don't have to have a manic or hypomanic episode to have this type of disorder. Again, you don't have to have a manic or hypomanic episode. You just have to have changing moods. And sometimes those moods just change between different dysphoric or negative states, um, severe psychomotor retarded depression, or then you may have severe anxiety, or you may have a period where you feel okay but not great, has a variety of names. So it gets confusing. Mood spectrum disorder, bipolar spectrum, or soft bipolar, atypical bipolar, subclinical bipolar. The DSM-4 calls it mood disorder NOS. The DSM-5 calls it bipolar disorder unspecified. And the ICD-10 calls it unspecified mood parentheses affective disorder. So it can be very confusing to patients because different clinicians throw these names around and, you know, patient goes from one doctor to another and it's like, yeah, but the doctor said I have this disorder. Um, I tend to refer to these when I talk to patients as conditions of unstable moods where they may fall genetically in that 
same group of disorders as bipolar disorder. But bipolar disorder is only 20% of this. 80% are people who never have manias or hypomanias and their moods are just unstable. But the treatments are similar and the treatments are different from, let's say, unipolar depression or an anxiety disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. Many of the frequent diagnoses these individuals get. Now, another reason why diagnosing is a problem is that, and this was a study done actually with bipolar 1 and 2 patients, and it really pertains to all individuals with mood disorders, is that the majority of the time that they come to see you, they have depressive symptoms, right? For bipolar 2, 50% of the time when they're, I, I shouldn't say when they come to see you, the majority of the time that they're symptomatic, they have depressive symptoms. Typically, they will come to see you when they're in one of those states. They don't come to see you when they're feeling fine or feeling great because they don't think they have a problem. And they're certainly not going to come to see you when they're manic because they feel fantastic unless family drags them in or they end up getting hospitalized. So again, you know, these people come in when they're depressed. They frequently get diagnosed with depression, unipolar depression. So mood disorders, I call the great imposters. They can present as a variety of different illnesses over time. Symptoms change. They have different symptoms. Depression is still the most common presentation when they come to see you. They have frequent episodes. So someone who comes in who tells you they go into these depressions five or six times a year, maybe they last a month, that's not unipolar depression. That does not happen with unipolar depression. When you see people with multiple episodes over the course of a year, they have a mood disorder. They can have very high rates of anxiety and agitation, so they frequently get diagnoses for anxiety disorders. They will typically present with a history of multiple diagnoses. So if I see someone <clears throat> who's been, and this is very common, they're going to doctors for five, six, seven, eight years, they will be given the diagnosis of depression, anxiety disorders, depression with anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, PTSD, and all too frequently they'll get the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. But sometimes these individuals can actually look like they have unipolar depression, which just is just another one of these more complicated aspects of diagnosis. So it, it can look like unipolar, but it's actually bipolar. So this is research that was done over 30 years ago by the National Institute of Mental Health. It was the Collaborative Depression Study. And this gave us our first clues that there's something different about depression in people who are bipolar and there are different risk factors that can predict this. So they looked at people over 11 years and to get into the study, you had to have unipolar depression. There, there couldn't be any doubt about it. 12% of these patients ended up being bipolar over time either so they thought they were unipolar, but as they followed them, they found out they were either bipolar one or bipolar two. because so they ended up having a manic or hypomanic episode during the course of their treatment. So they looked at these people to see what was different about this group. And this has laid the foundation for all of the risk factors that we should be looking for to tell us that when someone comes in and they look like they have unipolar depression or they just come in reporting depression, these are the things you look for. So for bipolar one, <clears throat> acute onset, it's just like somebody throws a switch. They'll come in and say, I was fine Monday, Tuesday, I'm like a different person. Um, and sometimes you can see people who will tell you they've been happy for years and all of a sudden one morning they wake up and they've been depressed ever since. 
And the families all confirm this. So very rapid onset, very severe symptoms. So you'll see these people who sort of crash and they become dysfunctional for a couple of days, terribly depressed, and they just sort of pop out of it. Um, these are not symptoms of unipolar depression. These are people who have mood disorders. May not be bipolar one, but they're mood disorders. And psychosis. If you're depressed with psychosis, the odds are you have a form, you have bipolar one disorder. For bipolar two, mood instability during the course of their illness and high energy. Very sensitive predictors that these individuals will end up being bipolar too. They found some other predictors in this patient population, and these are the things you want to look for. <clears throat> Family history. As I always say, respect genetics. These have very strong genet genetic transmission. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people come in they're diagnosed with unipolar depression. They have people in their family with bipolar disorder. And the person treating them never considered it. Early onset. When you see depression in adolescents, people who are young, there is a high possibility. It's not definitive, but there's a high possibility this is actually a mood disorder. Anyone who gets hypomanic or manic iron antidepressant has a mood disorder. If a woman comes to you and she's had two or three postpartum depressions, start thinking mood disorder. Um, hypersomnia with psychomotor retardation, almost always bipolar depression, is more likely to be bipolar depression than unipolar depression. Catatonia, the vast majority of people with catatonia have bipolar one disorder. Um, We've been taught it's really schizophrenia, but actually most of us know that these individuals that we see, and this is clinically what I've seen, end up having a form of bipolar disorder. Multiple generations of depression was a risk factor for uh, bipolar disorder. And patients who had family members who responded to lithium was a risk factor. So, these are all the questions you want to ask. You know, unipolar depression is a diagnosis of exclusion. It really should not take you very long to figure out that someone has the symptoms of depression. I mean, really, it can be done in five to seven minutes. The rest of the time is, well, what what's going on that's causing this? I can't tell you how many times I've seen physicians interview, and some of these are very prominent psychiatrists, interview patients, go into great detail that they fulfilled all the diagnostic criteria for depression, quickly ask them if they had hypomania or mania. The answer would be no. They go no further and they gave them a diagnosis of unipolar depression when in fact they had a lot of these other risk factors. So, and, and if they had asked, they would have made the proper diagnosis. So you have to ask these things. Let's talk about this other category that we see. Actually, it's quite frequent, and that's rapid cycling. These are people whose moods are basically all over the place. Change frequently, can go through a lot of different states. They tend to be highly reactive to things, or it appears that way. And frequently, they're diagnosed with personality disorder, specifically borderline personality disorder. Um, the other thing I, I'm seeing more recently is people like this who happen to have a, a history of abuse or report being brought up in very dysfunctional families are getting the diagnosis of complicated PTSD. When in fact, some of them, really what you're seeing is just very severe mood instability because they have affective disorders. <clears throat> so what's cycling and what's rapid cycling and bipolar disorder? So rapid is you have episodes that last for weeks to months and you have four episodes a year. That's not the most common. The most common is ultra rapid or ultradian cycling. 
And that's where your symptoms can change within days, sometimes weeks, or ultradian cycling. Your symptoms change in the course of a day. And in situations like this, we're really talking about people that have distinct moods for hours, right? Like three or four hours, and then they switch. So you can have someone who tells you they have a psychomotor retarded depression, you know, the beginning of the day for three or four hours, and then they start to feel better and their mood might actually be good or great for a couple of hours, and then they'll move into being very agitated. Um, so you can see patterns like this. So you always have to ask whether people have the same symptoms all the time and how quickly they cycle between these different mood states. So you'll see this up to a third of patients, actually. It's more common in women. It's seen a lot in adults, more frequently in adolescents. I see a lot of 16, 17, 18 year olds that are brought to me whose moods are highly unstable. They've been diagnosed with anxiety or depression. It, it gets missed that they have mood disorders. And again, as I said before, um, many are misdiagnosed as personality disorders. This is probably one of the most unjust things we can do to people. So once somebody gets a personality di disorder diagnosis, the concept is that this the treatment is primarily psychotherapy, which doesn't help people quickly. It's a long process. But yet I cannot tell you how many people I've seen who come to me, they're just on the wrong medicine. And when I change their medicine, typically it's take them off of antidepressants and put them on mood stabilizers. And we'll talk about this. These people will be significantly better within four to six weeks. So they go from someone who's highly emotionally reactive. It's constant chaos and disaster day in and day out. And that all melts away. And now you have a person who has a lot of stressors in their life, has difficulty coping with things, but the crisis is not always there. The intensity gets dialed down. They're more severe. They have greater number of episodes. They lack periods where they're symptom free. They have a worse long-term course and they have a much higher rate of comorbidity and disability. So just to review, what's the difference? Just to remind you, unipolar depression. <clears throat> the symptoms of depression do not change. Not during an episode, you know, they can be one way when they're 20 and then they have another episode when they're 50 and it can be different types of symptoms. But during the course of each episode, their symptoms stay the same. Their symptoms are persistent. They don't have days where all of a sudden they're fine. You have to ask that question. You'd be surprised the answer you get. How many people have come in and told me that, you know, they've been just depressed for years and I'll go to them. <clears throat> When's the last day you felt okay? And I swear I've gotten answers like, oh, last week I had a day where I felt okay. Hmm. How many days a week do you typically feel okay? Oh, maybe two or three. Oh, but the rest of the time I'm terribly depressed. So these are people who they don't have persistent symptoms all the time. So you have to check for different symptoms. It changes during an episode. And if they have a mania or a hypomania, they're bipolar one or two. Otherwise, you're really looking for unstable moods. What are the questions you ask? What are the clues that you look for so you don't miss the diagnosis? And again, remember, if you miss the diagnosis, these people have very severe morbidity and mortality, and you will treat them. You'll give them the wrong treatments, and more often than not, they won't get better. So as we said, probably a hundred times now, symptoms are not persistent. They can spontaneously have good days, as I just described to you. It's such a simple question to ask. 
When's the last time you had a day where you felt okay? That you weren't feeling terribly depressed? You'll make your diagnosis in 50% of the patients just by asking that one simple question. Now, some people are not good at recognizing their mood states, and you have to sort of tackle this a different way. You almost have to be a detective in this diagnosis. So you may ask people um, whether they go between periods of psychomotor retardation and agitation. Do they go through periods where they have insomnia or don't sleep as much, right? Because people, when they're manic, have less need for sleep. They don't see it as insomnia. They just sleep less. And then periods of hypersomnia. Do they go between fatigue and being energized, apathetic and motivated, withdrawn and very outgoing, having depressogenic thinking, negative, you know, down on themselves, and then 180 degree shift where they're positive, optimistic, and sometimes an inflated self-esteem. So a lot of times people will recognize one or two of these things in themselves. And then when you investigate further, what you discover is actually they have pretty predictable changes in their moods associated with this. So, for example, if they don't need as much sleep, they may be hypomanic or a little revved up. Or if they have insomnia, they may be agitated. And when they have hypersomnia, they have a more classic psychomotor retarded depression. So th those are just examples of things you can look for. Got to ask the right questions ask the right questions, carefully examine the course of their symptoms. Do they change in an episode? Do they have days where they're fine? Are they psychomotor retarded, depressed one day, agitated, you know, maybe a week later? People who present with a myriad of symptoms and multiple diagnoses, and I see this all the time, people have been treated for six, seven, eight years, they come in with you know, anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD, attention deficit disorder, borderline personality disorder. When I hear that, the first thing I start thinking about is, do they really have an affective disorder? Um, again, respect genetics, check family history, check risk factors. And if you do those things, you're much less likely to miss the diagnosis. So if the only tools you have are looking at symptoms, that's the way you need to do it. Let me tell you about how we do it at the Amen Clinic, which is one of the reasons I have come here. We don't look specifically at symptoms to form symptom clusters to form a diagnosis, right? That's what the DSM-3 or 4 does, or 5. We look at brain systems. We know that their brain systems neurocircuitry that produces or affects certain behaviors and symptoms. So that's what we look at. And how do we do that? Functional imaging. <clears throat> Why it's not used more in psychiatry, I mean, that's a long story in and of itself. We use spec scans, single positron emission, commuter, computerized tomography. I'm going to show you a couple of those in the next few slides. And that looks at function of different systems in the brain, different regions. If you don't do that, some people do brain mapping, QEEG. It looks at brain wavelengths in different areas of the brain to look at um, increased functioning, over-functioning, prediction of head injury. Again, how are different regions in the brain functioning? And then if you don't do either of those, you can use a detailed symptom ch symptom checklist, but not, again, not to look for these clusters of symptoms that fulfill DSM diagnoses, but to look for symptoms that tend to be related to different brain systems to get an idea of what you need to do to treat them. And let me tell you, it makes diagnosing much easier and much more accurate. So let's talk about SPEC and how it helps. <clears throat> Quick mini SPEC course. It looks at cerebral blood flow and neural activity. The way it works is you get this radioactive tracer. 
Your brain sucks it up really fast. And basically what the spec camera does is measure how well the different areas of your brain pick up that tracer. Do they pick up too little, which means they're over-functioning, normal, average, which is normal, or too much, which means they're over-functioning. You don't want to be too much. You don't want to be too little. We want to see things average, normal. And I'll show you what this means in a second. Helps with neuropsychiatric diagnosing. Evaluating suspected brain trauma, very common cause of neuropsychiatric symptoms or something that aggravates underlying illnesses. You can use it to look at um, suspected dementia. You can see um, the development of certain types of dementia five, ten years before you start to see symptoms. And that can also alert you to other things that you need to look for. Toxic exposure, substance abuse, infection like Lyme disease, um, inflammation. Um, you know, there's just so much there, there's so much information now that inflammation contributes to a lot of depression and a lot of other psychiatric disorders. So there's a normal spec scan. So basically, the computer produces two images for us. Your surface scan, we call that your thinking brain. Your active scan, deeper areas, we call that your emotional brain. The perspective is you're looking at the brain in here from bottom up, from top down, and from side and side. So, and it's the same for both. So in this scan, we're looking for areas that are not picking up the tracer well, that are under-functioning. And this gives us indications of whether perhaps head injury is contributing to this. If it looks like somebody's developing a dementia, um, if it looks like there's, they have a toxic brain from inflammation, toxic exposure, um, <clears throat> infection, so that's what we're looking for in this game. Again, these are not diagnostic. They give us indications of certain things. And in this scan, we're looking for deeper areas of the brain to see if they're underactive, but more so overactive. Um, you know, we'll look at the limbic system, the thalamus, which is the modulator of depression, deep, dark thoughts, mood instability and sleep difficulties. The basal ganglia, modulators of anxiety, um, certain movement disorders. It's the area that's sort of hijacked in addiction. The temporal lobes. These are areas that are involved in, well, the nickname is temporal lobes, so temper when they're damaged, um, but also things like mood instability, high emotional reactivity, anxiety, agitation, um, increased startle, and, and sometimes memory problems depend upon the area. And anterior cingulate, actually your cingulate is called the default mode network. It runs all along here. Um, but the anterior cingulate, the, this is from bottom up, this is the side, really is the area that is involved in sort of rigid thinking, obsessiveness, compulsiveness, getting over involved in things. So we, we look at these different areas because they're predictive of, you know, what we need to do to help either enhance their functioning or calm it all down. And this does not correlate to DSM-4 diagnosing, which is, you know, it's a long story, but this is portion, part of what the problem why this has not been taken up by um, psychiatry in general, because you just can't do the studies you need to using DSM as your diagnostic um, categorical system. So these are normal scans. So somebody comes in and they say they have treatment refractory depression, and I expect to see a scan like this. That would be a relatively normal scan. But I see a scan like this. Okay. This is a toxic brain. So this tells me <clears throat> there's something else going on here. 
that's causing this problem. Um, by the way, these holes that you see, these brains don't have holes in them. These are areas, this represents how the brain is not picking up the tracer well in these areas. If you looked at the brain, it would look absolutely normal. I mean, I have to tell this to patients all the time that you do not have a hole in your brain. Um, but what this represents is diffuse areas that are not picking up the tracer well. So now we go down a whole different road of investigation. You know, is there toxic exposure? Is there infection? Is this autoimmune? Right. This is not just simply, oh, you have unipolar depression or bipolar disorder and you're not responding to treatment. Or I may see something like this. Um, I'm sorry that this is blacked out, but basically what this is presenting is someone who has a um, what looks like frontal temporal lobe dementia, even though they may not be having symptoms. Again, you can see this stuff years before you actually see symptoms, but it's already causing the individual not to respond. I mean, I've seen this in people who They've been treated successfully for years and all of a sudden they stop responding to medication and nobody can figure out why. And then they come in and you see the reason why. And then you need to do a whole host of other things to try to maximize their brain health, hopefully to sort of slow down this process if you can, and hopefully give them the ability to respond to treatments again. Or I may see somebody who comes in and say, say they have attention deficit disorder. And I expect to see this. Right? This is really very low functioning of the frontal lobes. That's attention deficit disorder is a frontal lobe disorder, maybe a little in the temporal lobes. But I see this. In other words, it's relatively normal. And then it's like, hmm. This is probably not attention deficit disorder. There's something else causing this individual to have problems focusing and concentrating, even though they look like they're ADHD. So somebody comes in that says they have depression, or it actually may be that same person we looked at before that says they have attention deficit disorder, and you expect to see a scan like this. You know, pretty normal blood activity in their cerebellum, back part of their brain, some increased activity in, you know, limbic system, basal ganglia, anterior cingulate, um, but what you would expect, but they look like this, just they are super overactive. And this is an indication that they probably have an, a mood disorder. Might be bipolar disorder, it might just be unstable moods, in some cases, um, scans like this may be a combination of that and some PTSD. It, it's just an overfired limbic system and it just needs to get calmed down. But if you didn't look at the brain, you wouldn't know that. These people would more than likely get misdiagnosed as depression or attention deficit disorder. And they get put on antidepressants and potentially become worse or if they get put on stimulants and not infrequently You'll see these people that come in, they've been put on stimulus to get very, very agitated. When you look at their brains, this is what they look at, look like. So it's predictable that that would happen. We need to calm all this down. That's what I explain to people. And in doing so, a lot of people, their focus on concentration will improve or their depression will improve. <clears throat> and for those whose focus and concentration don't improve, at that point, they've actually do okay with stimulants. So those are some examples of how we would use spec scans. Let's look at treatment quickly. So from a traditional perspective, unipolar depression, the core of treatment is antidepressants. Mood disorders, the core of treatments are mood stabilizers, not antidepressants. More often than not, if someone has a mood disorder, antidepressants will not help them. 
or potentially make them worse, make their moods unstable, shoot them into a manic or hypomanic episode. If someone is bipolar 1 or bipolar 2, lithium carbonate is the gold standard for those disorders. Um, unfortunately, as the years have gone on, younger psychiatrists, for a number of different reasons, have not been taught about or used as much lithium as individuals like myself. And they're really not aware of all of the research indicating how effective it is for not just mood disorders, but also unipolar depression. And lithium, by the way, and lithium orotate, which is a supplement, if we have time, we'll talk about that a little bit, is the only substance that's suicide protective. So if you have individuals with a history of suicide, you're almost obligated to put them on lithium um, carbonate if they're bipolar 1 or bipolar 2, or at least lithium orotate if they're not. Um, otherwise, use a lot of anticonvulsants, Depakote, Tegretol, Trileptol. Um, Lamictal is an exceptional anticonvulsant for the depressive components of mood disorders in people who are rapid cyclers. And then second generation antipsychotics actually are being used more and more as treatments of these individuals because they can control mania, they're mood stabilizers, and some of them can prevent relapse into depression. But there are also a few of them that specifically have effectiveness for treating the depressive component in mood disorder. So in other words, they function effectively like antidepressants, but pharmacologically, they have completely different mechanisms of action. And then there are a bunch of interventional treatments. Um, I'm not going to go into them in, in a lot of detail. We don't have that much time. Um, I'll just say that ECT is the most effective treatment for bipolar or unipolar depression and mania. And it is the treatment of choice if it's someone you needed better yesterday. In other words, someone who is severely, severely ill. The response rates for ECT are 65 to actually not response remission rates for ECT, in other words, being asymptomatic, for 65 to 95 percent with a course of treatment, which typically is eight to 12 treatments, three treatments a week. With antidepressants, it's 35 percent remission rates with a single agent. And over time in multiple changes in medicine and multiple medications, maybe you can get to 65 percent, maybe. <clears throat> transcranial magnetic stimulation is being used more and more. It's a non-invasive, literally side effect free treatment for um, depression, possibly depression in affective disorders, not just unipolar depression, and also things like OCD and addiction. <clears throat> We're finding more and more uses for it. Ketamine, everybody's heard of that. S-ketamine, that's bravado, that's the nasal formulation. Um, It's very good for suicide symptoms. For some people, it is a game changer for depression. My experience has been for most people, it will work initially, but then it sort of stops working. Um, bright lights, these are very bright lights. You use them for seasonal affective disorder. And something we may hear more about in the future is near infrared lights, or what we call photobiomodulation and these near um, infrared lights are used to increase metabolism in mitochondria, the energy centers of cells um, to improve cellular functioning. They've actually been used for years um, in dermatology for helping with skin disease by improving cellular functioning in tissue. Let's talk a little bit about the functional medicine perspective. This is another reason why I came to the Amen Clinic, because I realized there are just a lot of people that we treat that just don't get better. Now, traditional treatment has really expanded in the past 30 years, and 
you know, we can treat a much larger portion of patients than I could have, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But there's still a lot of people that don't respond to treatment or have reactions that we just don't understand. And this is where functional medicine comes in, looking for these identifiable and treatable underlying abnormalities that are causing or aggravating all these symptoms. So they fall into a couple of categories. This is just a quick, you know, this is not the whole thing. This is a quick overview. Um, actually, head injuries are one of the most common reasons why we see neuropsychiatric symptoms. And here the treatment is going to be <clears throat> things like lifestyle changes, dietary changes, exercise, um, supplements, and hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, inflammation, looking at the causes for this. There's just more and more data coming out showing that inflammation underlies a lot of the causes of depression and other illnesses. Infection, Lyme disease, mold, you need to treat it. Um, exposure to toxicity, toxins we impose on ourselves, drugs and alcohol, environmental toxins, we need to remove them and detoxify people. Inborn errors of metabolism. This is our body's inability to metabolize certain vitamins or minerals, which run into a whole host of problems, which then cause neuropsychiatric symptoms. So they need to be identified. And typically, the treatment is replacement. Nutritional deficiencies, again, identifying and replacing them. Food sensitivities, identifying them and avoiding the foods. And then the whole aspect of gut health, which is there's just more and more evidence demonstrating to us that the gut is so important in brain function, everything function, our, our whole body. So. Functional medicine looks at all of these. <clears throat> Usually the question is, is, are some of these things the cause of the symptoms or just aggravating the condition? The way I usually look at it is if you have a clear family history, a lot of genetics in a family or someone who has had these symptoms since they were young, except for inborn errors of metabolism, it's, it's more likely that they have a primary psychiatric disorder that then is being aggravated by these things and you need to treat them so that you can actually then go and be successful in treating their psychiatric illness. But for people who have no family history and this isn't something they've had most of their life and all of a sudden something happens and they start having all these symptoms, then a lot of these issues very well may be the primary underlying cause of these illnesses and they need to be addressed. So let's talk about um, supplements. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to give you a brief overview. Um, these are numerous either single agents or typically combinations of agents which clinically have shown to be effective in a variety of different um, conditions, whether it be depression, um, mood disorders, attention deficit disorder, anxiety. Um, now I have found over time that surprisingly, now remember, I'm a traditionally trained psychopharmacologist. Um, this is not something that typically we would look at. I certainly would not have thought much about this 10 years ago. Um, but what's become clear to me, the more I use them, is that they are effective. Um, and not infrequently, I've seen them effective on their own, just using supplements. Um, more often than not, in more severe cases of bipolar disorder or severe depression, it's usually a combination of prescription medicine and supplements, but it really has enabled me to decrease individuals' exposure to prescription medicines, um, decreasing potential side effects. I've definitely seen that in anxiety. Um, using certain supplements like um, 
GABA, L-theanine, um, magnesium. I've seen these replace the use of benzodiazepines in many, many patients that I treat. Another interesting supplement is saffron. There's more and more information coming out on this, how it helps with mood, um, attention deficit disorder, and a host of other psychiatric symptoms. Um, so again, we're not going to go into this in detail. Perhaps I will come back at some point with part two and go over a little bit more about these both traditional and non-traditional alternative treatments. So what have we learned? <clears throat> Unipolar depression is different from depression seen in affective disorders or bipolar disorder. Just because people present with the same set of symptoms doesn't mean they have the same underlying etiology and it doesn't mean that they will respond to the same treatment. So don't miss the diagnosis. Ask the right questions. I can tell you if, if you're in dealing with a primarily psychiatric patient, patient population, it is going to be much more common that they have an affective disorder as opposed to unipolar depression. Look at the risk factors. If you have the benefit of using SPEC, um, it will help you. It's not diagnostic, but it will help you point you in the right direction of what types of treatments an individual needs. And as we saw before, it will also show you a host of other things that we normally wouldn't suspect that you need to look at. Because again, five people can come in with the same set of symptoms, but they don't have the same illness. They don't necessarily, they are not necessarily going to respond to the same treatment. And again, utilizing things like SPEC, you need to look for these other underlying identifiable, treatable illnesses that are causing or aggravating their conditions. I'd like to thank you for joining me. This is the end of our presentation. Um, I hope this has helped you and you've learned something from this, perhaps at some point, um, they will bring me back to do part two, um, specific to do part two, um, specific treatments and, and different cases. Um, but until then, um, please have an, an enjoyable rest of the day.